Hey everyone, Father Jacob Bertrand Jancic here. Father and Joseph Anthony Cress here. There he is. I wasn't sure <laughs> if I was going to introduce you, if you were going to introduce nah, I yourself, know. but I, you I did just it. decided to jump in and go for it. Awesome. Baby. Yeah, welcome mm -hmm. to this episode of God's Planning Live Splaining nice. Edition. Thanks to everyone who supports us, who's tuning in. Um, if you enjoy the show, as always, we love to ask you to consider making a monthly donation through Patreon. Uh, be sure to like, subscribe to God's Planning wherever you listen to your podcasts. So, yeah, thanks for tuning in this evening. Uh, Father Joseph Anthony and I are we're excited to be here. Uh, if you have questions as always on these live episodes feel free to drop them in the comment box and we'll get to them they tonight we're going to talk a bit about christian peace or the peace that christ offers so if you have questions about that as we're going uh, we're going to talk about that for just a handful of minutes i don't know 10 mm -hmm. minutes or so like we usually do um ask those questions or they can be about absolutely anything um so yeah it's your mm -hmm. time in a way so <laughs> before we get to peace father joseph anthony yeah, yesterday Ah, uh -huh. the eclipse. It was yeah, yeah. That was kind of cool. Um, it was awesome. So I, I didn't really see it too much uh, in Charlottesville. I think we were like eighty four percent totality or something like that at its peak. Um, I ended up getting like three hospital calls yesterday. I was on the hospital phone, so I was out doing hospital calls, and as I was walking out of the hospital. Um, everybody was like staring up at the sky and it just kind of seemed like it was like kind of overcast and about ready to rain, but there was definitely a different vibe to it. It's like, it kind of feels like it's nighttime, but it's not. Um, but my family, uh, who lives in Columbus, Ohio, they were directly in the path of totality. Um, which seems, sounds like a really cool, like indie rock band name, like path of, path totality. of totality. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, which, yeah, so many great uh, band nicknames. Anyway, uh, Path of Totality is going through Columbus, Ohio, and they got to see the entire thing. So uh, later that day, my phone blew up with a bunch of videos and things. And honestly, even through the videos, like it looked really cool. Uh, yeah. It was it was pretty impressive. Um, and just hearing the excitement of my family as they saw it, they're like, oh, my gosh, there's the diamond. And I, I didn't know what the diamond thing meant, but I guess there's this big diamond thing um in the path of totality it, it's just really cool to see the excitement and uh yeah it was it was a very strange and i think a uh, great experience for a lot of people not too bad though nice yeah in hanover we were like 95 percent or something <laughs> more than that but what it's something yeah. i learned i mean i watched it and that sort of thing but something i learned was that unless you're in like the path of totality it kind of doesn't really matter um yeah. i mean it, it it was cool and stuff but like we didn't we didn't like get blacked out that sort of thing it got really cold there was a big drop in temperature but mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. like a 10 degree drop in temperature but it was kind it, of the same as you though, just, what's that isn't that crazy like that the, is. the sun is so many miles away the like moon is so many miles, miles away, away and they can like cross paths and then like we feel that immediate effect of like the yeah. temperature dropping no that, that it is pretty cool that's it's nuts cool. I don't understand science and I definitely don't understand numbers or anything like that, but that freaks me out. Okay. Like, I don't know. Awesome. Well, I don't know. I don't is, speak the English good or nothing, but man, that that's, that's impressive. Thing. Good job. Yeah. God on like setting that up. Yeah. It, was it works. Cool. The sun works and really does. It's, it's yeah. Nice. I'm a big fan of it. Good observation. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, our own <laughs> Albert the great over here. Um, cool. Okay. <laughs> let's uh let's talk a bit about Woo. about peace particularly christian peace um yeah. why well we're just following up from easter um mm -hmm. easter was nine days ago ten days ago yeah. depending how you count what day you count easter beginning on um yeah, and me. something if you've been able to attend daily mass or even i get yeah uh the the sort of the gospel as we've been following has uh, since easter has followed the resurrection you know so a lot of the the stories of christ appearing to to the 12 particularly in the upper room and one of the first thing the very first thing that christ says to the apostles upon the resurrection is peace be with you he offers or in, in appearing to them, he offers them his his peace, and this this peace um, is is something that is 
we could say like the first gift of the resurrection in ways, you know, that yeah. it's what Christ, off, Christ offers. Um, so I thought we'd talk a bit about uh, what Christian peace looks like, uh, maybe a little bit, depending on what Father Joseph Anthony has to say, what it doesn't look like. Um, but uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's an important topic because it's something that, um, I think in different ways you hear a lot of people, I mean, I want it too. you know, we're, we're searching for peace, comfort, um, whatever it might be, tranquility in our lives. Um, but there, there's a way, there's a way by which we're able to attain it. Um, or perhaps I should say a way by whom we're able to attain it. Um, but, uh, yeah, we'll start with that. I don't know. Actually, I'll hand it over to you. Do you, Father Joseph Anthony, any initial thoughts here on, uh, Christian peace, peace that Christ offers. Yeah, I mean, especially when we look at the post-resurrection accounts, uh, peace is one of the things that the Lord continually opens up with when he's talking to his apostles and things. He's like, hey, peace be with you. And then he repeats it again, peace be with you. So the resurrected Lord is the one who who is offering us peace, um, but it's precisely to overcome our fears and that the trepidations and things like that. So it's it's interesting to see that how many times that the evangelist mentioned that the apostles were terrified or they were confused or they were unsure of the fact that, you know, who was this person that they are encountering and that the Lord uh, speaks into those things, those anxieties, those fears, those uh, trepidations. <clears throat> he speaks into them by giving his peace. So. I think it's it's a good thing to remind us that to not be afraid of the fears. It's not like we have to overcome our fears before we can encounter the Lord. Um, but he actually approaches us in those fears and anxieties, but he approaches us to give us his peace in the midst of that. So I think that's the first thing to recognize. And then the other aspect of Christian peace is for many people, I think they think it looks like just like total Zen, like I'm unaffected by the outside world because I'm just totally Zen about things. And it's like, shut up. No, you're not. Um, but it's peace is the union that we have with Christ so that even though the ex exterior circumstances in my life may not be super conducive to uh, prayer or they may be filled with suffering, but I can still have in an inner union with the Lord. So when we talk about Christian peace, it's about union with Jesus Christ and our peace is not necessarily found in or confirmed by our exterior circumstances. Yeah, there's um, when St. Thomas Aquinas talks about about peace or the reality of peace, he talks about it and, and points out that that peace is an effect of having mm -hmm. that which mm -hmm. is desired. Um, so. I, you know, when we when we think about the peace that Christ offers, it's not so much a thing that he gives um, right. in the sense of he's giving something other, but it's it it is it arises from being, as you were saying, Father Joseph Anthony, of being united to Christ, being in his presence, you know, like the resurrection accounts. Why is he offering his peace? What is the cause of the peace that he's offering to the disciples in this moment? Well, it's him. It's his present there it's he yeah. his, his his being there um so i think that's that's that kind of reorients or ought to in a, perhaps in a way are sort of like well what does you know as you were saying too it's not that the existential reality of everything is fine it's a question of you know what are we sort of aimed at what are we striving for who are we looking to be with you know who is kind of the rock in our life and if uh yeah in, in christ's peace doesn't he doesn't promise to take away the difficulties or no. the confusion, maybe not even the confusion, because I think the disciples were still probably a bit confused as to what was going on, even though they were recognizing Christ as the resurrected Lord. But um, it's it's a matter of that presence of being with Christ, of being united to him. Um, another thing that stands out, too, that I that one of my favorite scripture verses is from the Gospel of John, John 14, 27, when Christ says there, peace, I leave you, my peace, I give you, not as the world gives, do I give you, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? It's, it's this comparison to our sort of worldly expectations of peace versus our versus what Christ offers, you know, again, I'm kind of repeating what I already said and what you said, Father, you know, it's not. We're not hunting after a sort of removal of 
of difficulties, difficulties or, right? Yeah, but challenges or whatever. Afterwards, it's it's the search and and the and the possession of God who wants to be possessed by us that that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is the source of our peace. So I think that's an important thing to to keep, yeah, I, keep in mind. I mean, I really I really do think that peace. Um, you know, you bring up the the scripture citation of like the you know not as the world gives do i give it to you um because i think a lot of times the world is actually looking for peace and it might articulate it that way but what it's really looking for is comfort it just wants the easy that you know it wants to remove the challenge remove the difficulty and just strive for that which is comfortable because if i can be comfortable then i'm at ease and i'm at peace and that's not the reality there right the lord never uh promises to take away um and and he definitely doesn't he doesn't promise to take away the str the struggle or the suffering or the hurdles of our life and he never really promises comfort like he just doesn't ever promise us you know anything that's comfortable he promises us the cross uh, and he says, we got to take up that sucker every single day. Um, but he doesn't promise us comfort. And yet he still brings his peace in the midst of that. So there's got to be something different between Christian peace and worldly peace. And I think that's because the worldly peace assumes that peace can only be achieved via comfort. And the Lord offers something completely different uh, because he recognizes that our life is always going to include some kind of suffering and yet peace is still attainable because it's in when we unite that suffering to the sufferings of our lord when we ourselves become united to the lord then it is only then when we find peace yeah it reminds me of that quote from pope benedict the 16th right what is it like the world offers you comfort but you're not made yeah, for yeah. comfort you're made for greatness greatness mm -hmm. um Just yeah telling. that's really good job pope benedict that's really true um, and we could think of it in terms of you know, our, <laughs> our striving for um, for holiness often oh, is, is a striving, it's a challenge, it's a difficulty, but there can also be peace in that, you know, in fighting temptation, in in growing in virtue and striving for that. So um, in the end, it, it's a matter of that presence of Christ, but also like what are we aimed at? What are, what are mm -hmm. our lives aimed at? Is it like for the earthly comforts or is it for heaven? And when it's you know when our when we grow in the theological virtues and our and our hope is placed in in heaven, it, it changes. It gives new tenor to what we're experiencing here and now. So, um, yeah, I think that's yeah. What and I, I think, think. But go ahead. Yeah, I don't know. I want to say one more thing. I think uh, quite often people talk about inner peace. I just have this inner peace about me, you know, and they expect it to be like there is no. Um, I don't want to say inner turmoil or tension or, or mm -hmm. things like that, but we know that the human person, you know, is suffers from the effects of sins and and suffers from you know concupiscence and the the passions are disordered or they're unruly and things like that. And it takes you know the intellect and the will to order those to the good, but that's not necessarily easy in anything. And I think when people look for this ease of inner peace they actually end up becoming just completely dictated by their passions because they want this like you know i'm at harmony inside of myself and whatever like there's no tensions within me and it's like no we live with a fallen humanity that experiences the effects of sin and it takes our intellect and will to order those passions to the good and not just to search for things that there is no fight there is no struggle in the interior if that's the case then that means our passions have totally overwhelmed and they're in control that's not peace. That's complete, um, you know, like the photo negative of our true identity of who we're supposed to be. So um, I find those people difficult to deal with. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful. It, it inspires a lot of peace in my life. So, yeah, that's what I'm here for, man. <laughs> awesome. All right, cool. Well, as we continue, we have many days left of the Easter season. It's 50 days in total. Um, so what, we're day nine. So we have about 41 days-ish, 40-ish days left of the Easter season. Um, what? <clears throat> we'll move towards the Ascension and then Pentecost ends the Easter season. So um, in these days of of Easter, perhaps this is something to, to pray about, to ask our Lord about. Um, about his peace, how he's inviting you to encounter him and what he offers, his peace, his 
his dare I say his own his comfort comfort in the promises that he uh, that he makes to us in hope founded on the resurrection eternal life so mm -hmm. uh, food food for thought or fodder for prayer or something. Um, but there you go. Okay. Well, let's jump to some questions. We're going to, we're going to take questions from some of our Patreon supporters first, and then jump over to our live questions. So if you have them, drop them in the comment section and we're going to get to them in short order, but, um, we're going to take this question first from Alec, one of our Patreon supporters. Thanks for your support. Um, let's see. Alec says, Hey father, speaking of peace as a convert, I find the sign of peace in the mass strange. To me, it's a weird juxtaposition that the solemn moment of the breaking of the bread overlaps with hugs, kisses, and peace signs. Any thoughts on how I can view this moment more charitably? It's mm -hmm. a good question. You want to take a stab, Father? Yeah, it needs to be uh, replaced with fist bumps on everybody. He left out fist bumps. He said hugs. He said handshakes. Homeboy left out fist bumps. Um, no, I, I, I actually... The sign of peace is, is a beautiful moment. Honestly, it's a, it's an important moment. Um, it's drawn from the scriptures where the Lord tells us that like if we have anything against our brother, we have to leave our sacrifice at the foot of the altar and go reconcile with our brother uh, in order to then come back and offer the, the proper sacrifice. So the expression of peace is that reconciliation that we have with our brothers and sisters so that we can be in the presence of the sacrifice and then the offering. So it's actually a really important point. And I think it, there's a lot of elements that we tend to approach the mass from a, maybe a spectator's perspective or um, from entertainment in these really important moments that are rooted in, in scripture um, kind of get lost on us. I think the other aspect is that we see the first attempt at reconciliation with our brothers and sisters actually being the confidi or at mass when we ask our brothers and sisters you know we confess our sins to them i confess to you almighty god and to you my brothers and sisters that i've sinned um and then we ask for their forgiveness we ask for their prayers um and so what begins at the penitential right actually comes to completion with the sign of peace right before we enter into receiving the blessed sacrament so um, receiving the Blessed Sacrament and Communion. So I think these important moments are not just like intermissions in the liturgy so that we can like, you know, interact with each other or, you know, anything. It's, it's actually a really important moment that we do express in a physical way the reconciliation that we have, that maybe we have some bad blood between each other, uh, reference intended. And then, um, but we can reconcile that in with a real expression so that we can uh, approach the true sacrifice the eternal sacrifice and receive the graces that are proper to it yeah that's all true i agree with alec <laughs> i think it is all however true that is uh in what you've just described of the true nature of the sign of peace i think by and large nobody gets that and it is a distraction mm -hmm. actually in the diocese of manchester where where my parish is, where we are not allowed to celebrate the sign of peace during mass. So the bishop has still. Mm -hmm. Yep. So with it, it was started during COVID, but he's not he's just like given... killed it all up. Mm -hmm. Yep. Interesting. OK, um, I yep. know there's been there's been a lot of like conversation and kind of debate back and forth about the placement of the sign of peace. Is it better right before uh, the reception and communion is it better like at the offertory of mass or maybe earlier so there's some like kind of theological and sacramental conversations about where the sign of peace should be placed um in that sense so sometimes those conversations come up like that yeah yeah i mean i think this this come like requires a bit of catechesis in the church mm -hmm. um it's not just saying hey to people it's what you described you know father so yeah cool okay let's let's we have a another set of questions from a patreon donor okay in acts when one of the pharisees says to leave the apostles alone because if the movement is not of god it will die and if it is of god there's nothing they can or should do about it is he uh being prophetic or just reasonable slash faithful oh, that's a good question mm -hmm. i would say it depends what you mean by being prophetic um, and it depends yeah it depends what the words mean so is he a prophet in the proper sense no is it a sort of prophetic 
thing in the sense that it came to be sure um i also think it's a reasonable it's kind of it's like occam's razor here right no pascal's wager that's what i'm thinking it's like pascal's yeah, yeah, yeah. wager um that you know pascal's wager is famously is if god exists um then we ought to you know obey the commandments but if god doesn't exist obeying the commandments is still a good way to live so like it's a win-win obeying the commandments um so i think this is a, a similar thing here when one of the pharisees recognizes that if it's if it's a good thing and if it's of god then it'll it'll be all right and if it's not it'll destroy itself so i think that's it's kind of a reasonable approach to something so there's a second part here let's read that and then father you can i didn't read ahead so maybe i won't assign it to you directly but you know it could i didn't be yours. read ahead either so we'll see cool. what happens did saint john understand the full theological implications of his gospel in some ways could a 21st century catholic have a better understanding of revelation than the evangelists themselves due to oh come on show it due to centuries of doctrinal development you want to take it you want me to go um uh, I'm going to go back and discuss the like prophetic reasonable thing. Why does that have to be the like juxtaposition? Like, can't things that be reasonable also be prophetic and shouldn't prophecies be reasonable enough? You know, so I don't, I don't necessarily see why those two are the only options there. The St. John thing, um, the fullness of revelation, did he understand all the implications of that? Um, I, I don't I don't think you can say that he knew how that would be the implications of all of his theological developments and theological writings of his gospel. I don't think you could say that he knew every little um, aspect of of it and how that would be applied two thousand years later from him. You know, I think he he you know obviously was inspired by the by God himself to to give voice to these revelations, both in his gospel and in the book of Revelation. Um, and to write in such a way that it was, it did carry the theological significance of that. Um, I think with the respect that like sacred scripture is ever ancient and ever new, um, that the human author, the evangelist of it can have an, a concept and an idea of the importance of this for his particular audience. But I don't think you have to assign the importance of it for the centuries and generations. I mean, he's not necessarily writing for um, the shelf life to it and make sure that this is a perennial uh, sacred book. I mean, he's writing for a specific purpose and a specific audience. Um, the same way that we would talk about St. Paul and his letters to specific uh, churches and communities, Christian communities, that he's writing for that community, but yet it's important to see the truths that are uh, conveyed in that have a, a application and importance for all of us um even throughout the centuries yeah john um, being one of the one of the 12 the beloved disciple would have had the fullness of revelation um exactly. which yeah. all of the 12 well the, the which the apostles had judas didn't really um but or he the whole judas thing complicates it but being one of the 12 had the fullness of revelation and grace um, which is different than different than the grace of the evangelists, because not all the evangelists were one of the twelve. Um, but so it kind of, I think it, it becomes a bit more uh, what like complicated when we're discussing John by way of example, because not only is he one of the twelve, but he also has the grace of an evangelist and the grace of you know this this apostolic grace of founding the church and the fullness of revelation um, given to the twelve. So, but like to Father Joseph Anthony's point. You know, does that mean that John sort of foresaw that the the sort of theological arguments that would come up in centuries to follow and was addressing those like in the gospel and that sort of thing? No. Um, does it mean that he understood what he was writing and that sort of? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. You know, so he he's not just a, a tool. He is a true author inspired by the moved and inspired by the Holy Spirit. So um, it's kind of a both and, but certainly more with John because he, he is both apostle and evangelist. So kind of cool. I hadn't thought about that before, but that's that's neat. Can we say neat? I've been banned sure. from saying the word interesting by my own what? because I say it too much. So I'm trying not to say it as much on, on the podcast or just in life, in life, mostly here when I'm teaching yeah. at the parish, I always say that's interesting. That's interesting. interesting to know. Yes, yes, okay. that's interesting. 
All right, we're going to turn to some of our live <laughs> questions. So Reagan or Regan, sorry. Hey, fathers, in the next few months um, and years, my friends and I are graduating. And I'm curious if you have any advice for maintaining and growing these relationships since we're all going to be starting new jobs and won't be able to see each other as much. I am fearful that it may be a hard transition. Also at me, Father Jacob Bertrand, Confessions on Catholic Classics has been so helpful. So thank you. You're welcome. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Uh, Father Joseph Anthony. What do you think? Yeah. Um, okay. So my advice to this is if you are, it sounds like you're in college. Um, I'm going to scroll up and see. Yeah. It sounds like you're in college um, and you're getting ready to start your new jobs. Everybody disperses to new cities and things like that. Um, I always tell the students that are graduating, like ideally you need about three friends to identify and invest in to say like, yeah, actually, I want to continue this friendship into the next phase of my life, right? And you've been a good friend to me. I value your friendship. I want to continue this, and I want to invest in that. Now, that means when you invest in a friendship through a life transition, you got to be somewhat intentional with it, especially if you are, uh, you know, remote from each other in different cities or different locations. And so um, don't be afraid to kind of identify certain things so say like hey you know can we make sure that we chat every tuesday night let's you know make sure that we catch up on a regular basis and actually not just say like oh i want to talk on i want to talk all the time but like kind of get specific with it kind of get gritty with it and say like yeah actually i'm gonna i'm gonna block out tuesday nights and let's catch up every tuesday night so i think if you can identify you know one night a week or you know every a specific time of expected communication can be really good. Um, and then even beyond that is to like, you know, even identify like, you know, some time to get together, like, you know, how about uh, times to visit each other and or, you know, go and share a vacation together and actually catch up with each other in in the presence of the other person, because it's good to stay connected. We love staying connected, but being connected and being present to the person are very, very different things. And so I think setting some expectations and communicating um, with intentionality is a really good thing to foster and sustain friendships into different phases of life. So that'd be my advice. Cool. Let's take this from Ron. Not so much a question, but I was a hospital chaplain since 1979. I see a lot of peace in my patients just as they pass from this life. I'm almost 80 and death holds no fear. Learning the Catholic approach to the faith for the first time. Peace to you all. Thanks. Yeah, death is, it's funny as like, I'm not a hospital chaplain and I never have been at least full time, but I do work for mm -hmm. the hospital here as an on-call chaplain overnight. So I only get called in, um, when there's an emergency um and it's sometimes people are i mean often in these circumstances people aren't conscious um but um if i'm visiting sick parishioners or dying parishioners or people who are conscious i i've gotten the whole gamut um of people who are at peace and who are mm -hmm. you know quote unquote ready to go to people who are totally terrified um and a combination of all of the, you know, of, of both in between. So, um, yeah, it's death is death is a, is a tough, it's tough people, you know? So yeah, but I, I'm glad to hear that, mm -hmm, that that's mm -hmm. the case too. So cool. Um, great from Luke thoughts on connecting more deeply to the mystery of the resurrection. I find the passion of our Lord more grittily human, but meditation on the rec on the resurrection feels more foreign. Hmm. I like that idea, maybe in ways. I think the, mm -hmm. at least from the outset, I don't know, do I have thoughts on connecting more deeply? I don't know if I have thoughts on connecting more deeply, but I, I at least want to affirm the observation. I haven't thought of it in those ways, but, you know, the death, the suffering and death of our Lord is a very human thing. Um, the Like humanity is on full display in that in ways. Um mm -hmm. And not that his humanity is not involved in the resurrection, of course it is, but the resurrection. So that's that's to say that I think we can connect more with physical suffering than we can the resurrection, just because of yeah. human experience and observation. I so mean, I think you're you're totally. The thing right. is, we've all experienced suffering in some capacity. Yeah. Um, 
And so when we hear and we see that, it's like, yeah, maybe I haven't been crucified. Maybe I haven't get, been scourged. Definitely have never had a crown of thorns put on my head. But like, I know what a thorn is. Like I've grabbed a rose stem on, you know, and, and pricked myself. So it's like, I do have some experience of suffering. Um, and so, yes, it's easier. It might be, let's say a little more natural to connect with the passion and the suffering of our Lord. Um, because the resurrection is actually not natural. It's supernatural. And I have yet to experience a resurrection. Um, so that might be a little why it's, it seems like a little cartoonish or a little fantastical because I've yet to experience something that I can make an, um, a reference to in my own, uh, experiential knowledge that it doesn't mean it's real. It doesn't mean it's not, um, yeah, it doesn't mean it's not real, but it, it is, I think, a, there's a different engagement with it. It may be a little more challenging. Yeah, and I don't know if I have good tips for connecting with the resurrection more than that, so if, because there isn't there isn't a way to sort of experience it in a direct, you know, so it's, it's hard to say, um, but I think that's okay. It's foreignness is okay. That's what I have to offer. Uh, yeah, um, I'm trying to think. I mean, at the end of the day, when these things come up, I always tell people, it's like, hey, ask for the gift. If there's something confusing or if you have a desire, it's like, oh, I really want to understand this mystery more. There's a there's a reason we freaking call them mysteries of the faith. Like, it's not easy. Yeah. So don't be afraid to ask the Holy Spirit, like, hey, help reveal this to me or help me um, depend on this mystery or engage with it or understand it. Like, that's not easy for our human capacity or in our human intellect to engage with. It doesn't mean it, it can't or it's incapable of, but to ask the Holy Spirit to guide us into that and express our desires, I think is a beautiful prayer of itself. Yeah, that's a good point. Cool. Thanks. Good work. Mm -hmm. uh, question from Black Elk. Hey, fathers, uh, how would you respond to someone who argues that morality is relative to culture, suggesting that we pursue that what we perceive as moral is merely a human construct? Love your work. Mm -hmm. God bless. Thanks. Thanks. Man. Ideas, thoughts? I was going to say, you can lead off with this one. Cool. I mean. um, so what I think is a good place to start um, is sometimes with extreme situations here to point out that or to, to sort of get to the place where we can recognize that something is um, is always and everywhere wrong. So like the killing, the random killing of an innocent child seems to be something that that is it that that m most everybody or i would even be as bold as to say as to claim that everybody who has f uh like use of their faculties of their reason would would agree that that's that's an evil thing to you know to kill an innocent person or, or especially a child i think if we can make a point that that there is room for anything um for for even just one exception to the to the relative to culture clause then that then that doesn't stand right that there's there's something that transcends either human construct or cultural construct um that is common to at least our who we are in our in our human nature that there are things that go that violate our our human nature i think that's actually a pretty easy step to 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 get to and people who would be unwilling to concede that point um are are um not worth having the conversation with because <laughs> they're they're not being reasonable um it's a different question than to say like okay well all are, are all of the nuances and details of morality do they have you know are there do they are they applied to different cultures or you know do, do they come to the fore more in particular cultures like yeah, of course they do. They have throughout history and that sort of thing. So that's a different argument. But if we can start somewhere and say, okay, there is something other than just like a cultural or human construct yeah. Um, yeah. that is part and parcel of our humanity, um, then the relativity kind of becomes a bit more difficult to hold on the whole. I mean, I, I think ultimately this comes down to similar arguments about like the relative relativity of truth and existence and things like that. And I think you have to work and, and really ask the person is like, do you do you posit or do you create truth and reality in yourself and project it into existence? Or does reality 
truth exist and impose itself upon you in your like so do we exist in reality or does reality exist in our in our minds and we create it um because if we exist in reality and truth and then there are certain laws principles of existence that do not depend on us and we actually have to pursue and they are you know equal opportunity employers they they are e equally imposed on every single human person uh, no matter uh, socioeconomic race location geography century of existence or anything like that it's it, they're perennial truths uh, including moral truths so i think it's it's something that's like well if we exist in a reality then there is truth that exists that imposes itself on us and that we are to pursue and understand versus if i get to create my reality and you get to create yours then yeah if, if that's how you live then nobody ever exists and nobody interacts with each other because everybody's in their own simulation um type of a thing so it's it's a weird kind of um I don't know where take or iteration on like just the relativity of truth uh, with a morality kind of flair to it but i think it comes down to this fact of like do we exist in in a common reality with a a, a, a singular truth that we that we all kind of pursue or not yeah cool all right um <clears throat> We have one more question here. So if you have another burning question, drop it in the comment section now. So that way we can get to it. This is from Emily. Fathers, regarding the confidior, the penitential mm. rite, it sounds like the laity are beating their chests with closed fists too firmly. Should we be more gentle with ourselves or not? Um, I don't know. I think people can bow, no. do what they want. Um, I would say this. I, I have heard people really like really go like hurt themselves on this and they think it's like what should be done the instruction to strike one's breast during the confidior is to done to be done for us to remind ourselves of our sinfulness not to punish ourselves and that's the thing that i think is really important so when i see people are like really trying to hurt themselves like i need to feel the pain of my sins yeah the confidior is not that time it really isn't so like the striking of one's breast is to help remind you of the fact that you have transgressed and there has been a, a, a punishment or a hurt in this relationship. It's a reminder. It of itself is not the punishment. So one should not be trying to hurt themselves or feel it as hard as they can. So I, I would really, really temper people who are like are, you know, with a closed fist and trying to thump their chest as if they're a silverback gorilla in the zoo or something like that. Nah, don't do that. Yeah, I like that distinction. That's a good distinction. That it's not the punishment, it's a reminder of our mm -hmm. guilt. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, we have one more comment. We're just gonna put it up here because it's a good one. up. Uh, yep. also from I stand with St. Louis de Montfort. There's one truth or there is no truth sweet very true there we go see what i did there awesome okay wait we got one more question coming in got coming in hot time. part one of two but um happy easter and good early yeah, morning easter. and everyone um it's evening here for me uh but same happy part, whatever time of day good morning to you just a question on how can um how to answer someone who has said that people who are mentally disabled should be used as organ donors um well that's i've never heard that before but i guess if you're asking um someone has asked that um i think we simply apply appeal to their human dignity that they're not instruments um they're not mm -hmm. objects i mean you know they're humans uh and mm -hmm. ought to be afforded the same dignity that we each of us possess inherently um yeah no human is to be used as an object absolutely so i think that's yeah i mean kind of whether the person i think whether the person has mental disabilities or um has like physical disabilities like neither of those situations lessen the dignity of that individual person so um, no matter the disabilities, physical or mental, they they should not be used um, as replacement parts for another. Like that, yeah, that that doesn't just make sense at all. 
Yeah. The the second part here that in view of Peter Singer used IVF to harvest their organs. Yeah. Same answer. Oh, okay. <clears throat> but yeah. Um, cool from Allison. What up, Allison? She Allison writes, I work in HR for a large public school district and um and I'm being asked to help plan a month of mindfulness to include guided meditation and yoga. Am I overreacting by removing myself from planning? Um, I've heard concerning things about these practices. Um so what would I say? No, I don't think you're overreacting. So yoga, I think, is something to be very cautious around. Mm -hmm. um, it, even when it's used as, as sort of exercise kind of thing, it's founded in Eastern spirituality that is often at odds with Christian spirituality. So the, the whole kind of mindset and approaching that, I think, ought to be, we ought to be cautious around. Guided meditation, I mean, that seems like such a broad... Um, I, I know what you're asking, so I'm not trying to like be like, oh, don't worry. But like generally, I think we it depends a lot. Like, what does that mean? What are we being guided towards? That sort of thing. Um, but are you overreacting? I don't think so. I think if you, I, th I, I mean, I think there are certain like yoga ought to be avoided. So I think that's full stop. Um, and if if you're sort of being you know able to step away and not have sort of involvement in planning that for other people, then I think that's totally fine. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think I'm over. I mean, the, the, no, nah, I think these things, as always, like you have to deal with prudence and discretion and say like, hey, I'm willing to help in these areas. You know, obviously, I don't have final say. I, you, I can't make the um, total decisions on this, but like I'm willing to help with X, Y and Z, A and B. I'd rather, excuse me, I'd rather not be a part of. So like, if don't be afraid to actually step aside from that um, while still being a part of some other aspects of it cool all right i'm not sure if i'm going to be able to answer the oops sorry from slow money time would a thomas be a math realist it seems rather that math is a tool which has been turned into an idol so it's a good uh, it's a question um i mean i believe math is real um yeah. math, I well i think i'm math not realist. good at it <laughs> okay uh, <laughs> um, what would I say? The so as far as I understand, a math realist is, holds it like numbers, etc. This is a far probably too simple simple of an explanation, but numbers they they are real and exist outside of human mind. So that like the concept exists. Would I don't think that it, so I could be totally wrong. Um, I don't think that a Thomist would hold to math realism um, because we don't hold to sort of like the Thomists typically don't hold, at least in the physical world, to an, like the existence of forms, um, you know, sort of thing. So like so this is a much more platonic idea. And though Plato is involved in Thomistic in Thomas's thought, he's he's much more of an Aristotelian when he engages with the created world. Um, Plato understood that there were sort of these perfect, everything that exists has this kind of perfect ideal that exists in a sort of like, um, kind of like an immaterial kind of thing. So when we think of do a dog, there's like, there's the form of a dog, the, the perfect essence of a dog that exists and all dogs participate in that, in that form. Um, Aristotle and Thomas following don't believe in that. And in a way, I, now again, I could be misunderstanding, but um, the, I, the, the sort of math reali realism seems to be a sort of like, there's there are these numbers exist outside of physical things. I don't think that, I think Thomas would say that in order for there to be three, you need to be able to count three physical things in a way, you know? So um, in the same, in, the, in a similar way to say that like, time doesn't exist outside of creation you know there needs to be a measurement of change in order for time to exist so mm -hmm. that would be my answer um cool and another one from emily i'm planning to read dignitatis infinita 66 paragraphs have you read it i have not have you um i have not no um i i think we talked to some of the other uh, friars on the podcast and um you know i think we just it, it just hit yesterday so some of us are just starting to work through it or things like that so i would expect to hear some more from the friars on it in future uh engagements episodes blah blah blahs 
But um, yeah, I haven't been able to actually sit down with the document. So unfortunately, I got nothing to say on it. Boom. This one's, for, this one's for you from James. Father Joseph Anthony, off topic question. What kind of lights are you using for your background? It looks. Oh, so thanks, bud. I love it. Um, so I have one just LED um, softbox in front of me for my key light. And then I have two uh, accent lights, um, one set to red and the other set to purple. Um, just kind of square little. Let me see if I can just, you know, one of these little guys. So it's on a stand and I have another one that's actually right behind my back right now um, that's on the stand too. So they're just set to different colors to kind of give it some uh, texture. I figure in the space that I'm in, I don't have a lot of like actual, um, you know, room behind me. I don't have actually a lot of physical space behind me. So I have to create some texture with the lighting. Um, and so that's the way I've set it up. But yeah, just simple little, uh, LED lights that I got off of Amazon. Nothing too fancy. Sweet. But thanks thanks for noticing. I love the production side of things. I love like tinkering and playing around with that. So I do it mostly for myself, but if other people enjoy it, I'm happy to uh, hear that kind of feedback. Well, there you have it. All right. Those are our questions. So we're going to leave it there for the night. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks for listening to this episode um, of Live Splaining. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, X, whatever Twitter's called now. Instagram, like, subscribe, leave a five-star <laughs> review. Super pumped for that. Thanks a lot. If you'd like to donate to the podcast, support us, you can do so through Patreon. You can follow the links in the link in the episode description below. Episode notes. You can also follow links in the notes to shop Godsplitting merch to get information on our upcoming Godsplitting retreats and events. Um, as always, again, thanks for tuning in. Happy Easter. Um, happy post-eclipse day happy <laughs> whatever uh know of our prayers for you please pray for us and until next time god bless